So when I was dealing with my worst bouts of depression, I was dealing with sleep insomnia alongside of it. I think they call it depression-induced sleep insomnia where you're depressed and it's hard to sleep at the end of the night. All the anxiousness, all the stress, all the depression would sink in and be hard to fall asleep. So essentially, I was dealing with that before I started my fitness journey where I was just super depressed and then in the evening it would hit me 10 times harder. I would have trouble falling asleep and I would do my best to try to fall asleep, but I couldn't. And then when I did, it would be sometime around midnight and then around 3 a.m. I would wake up wired as hell, cortisol levels extremely high, like sunlight just hit my eyes and it's ready to go, ready to get up and go. And this is something I dealt with for a few years and it actually made things worse. It was hard for me to regulate my emotions, regulate my stress, my anxiety, my depression, all because of sleep deprivation. It worsened my depression. It made things so much worse to a point where I was like, something needed to change. Now, I talk about exercise all the time and how it was, it was essentially my saving grace. And it was something that jump-started my sleep journey as well. And I'll get, on, get into that in this three-part series. But in this video, I just wanted to go over sleep, why we sleep, how melatonin is produced in the body and things like that. And I hope this helps. So with that being said, let's get into it. Now you gotta understand that sleep optimizes every bodily system we have. It helps with recovery. If you're in this fitness journey, it helps with muscular development. It helps eliminate brain toxins towards the end of the day when we accumulate the toxins in our brains. It helps with so many things. Sleep is essential to everybody. It's crazy when I hear people get four hours of sleep and I'm just like, bro. And I resonate with the guys that just have trouble falling asleep. But it's one of those things where if you're encountering this, there has to be a way around it. You have to focus on some specific way around it. It's essential for physical and mental health as well. Sleep deprivation can lead to a lot of risks of illnesses, it actually can lead to weight gain because we tend to, with sleep deprivation, we tend to consume more calories on average with processed foods and things like that. Processed foods tend to be a lot more appetizing when we're deprived of sleep. As I mentioned before, with my depression, it can worse things like depression, anxiety, emotional regulation, memory recollection, and so on and so forth. As you know, uh, large bouts of stress can lead to things like depression and anxiety. So if you're not getting enough sleep, you're not getting enough recovery, stress levels go up. And something like sleep, sleep is one of the best tools that you can utilize in terms of recovery. So if you're not sleeping, your stress levels continue to go up and things just get significantly worse. And then it leads to things like worsened depression, worsened anxiety, and so on. When it comes to sleep, there are two bodily processes that we need to understand in order to better our sleep. Number one is adenosine. Adenosine is a key regulator in sleep. Adenosine builds up in our brain and it primes us to fall asleep. I like the term sleep pressure. There's a lot of research going around where, you know, sleep pressure occurs and this is a result of elevated levels of adenosine. And adenosine, when it's when you have high levels of adenosine, you start to get really sleepy. And you can call it adenosine, you can call it sleep pressure. I like sleep pressure, it sounds kind of cool. Essentially, the, the adenosine buildup, that sleep pressure is accumulated as a result of just doing things day to day. It's basically made up of all the activities that we do in our day to day. So something like working out, which has been shown to help with sleep quality, and it's a hack that I emphasize. It's one of those things where it builds that pressure to fall asleep, that adenosine buildup as a result of physical exercise, not only for the body, but also for the mind. It starts building up the sleep pressure and then things like getting outdoor sunlight, having a consistent sleep schedule and also going into our circadian rhythm can help build sleep pressure, which I'll talk about number two. Just wanted to interrupt this video real quick, guys. I created an ebook series called Lift Your Mood and it's essentially three hacks that improve your mood and well-being. These hacks are utilized to help with depression and anxiety. And if you're interested in them, you can head on over to the link in the description below. Free download, get access to our free course content and also gain access to our Mood Lifters Alliance community where we as essentially help people exercise out of depression. Now with that being said, let's get back into it. Number two is our circadian rhythm. The circadian rhythm is a biological clock and you've probably heard of it before. But if you have a consistent sleep schedule, it's easier for you to fall asleep and be consistent with your biological clock, your circadian rhythm. With circadian rhythm, it's controlled by light exposure. Light keeps us awake for longer periods of time. And this perfect example is like, if somebody wants to pull an all-nighter and they start getting sleepy towards the end of the night or like around 4 a.m. and then the sun comes out and they go outside and they get some sunlight in their eyes, they tend to, they tend to feel like they have a second wind. That's, that's our circadian rhythm reacting to light exposure. And tying into this, darkness, is what promotes sleep. 
When darkness occurs at night, our body produces melatonin to prime us to fall asleep. Now, with that being said, let's talk a little bit more about light exposure. In light exposure, most people tend to obviously wake up when the sun rises. You know, the light comes in our eyes, we wake up, and it primes us to get into action. When we wake up, cortisol is essentially released. When cortisol is released, it primes us to wake up and we wake up and get up, right? Get to basically take action on whatever we have to do there to essentially seize the day, right? And from there, that release of cortisol sets up a timer of the sort that basically tells our body to produce melatonin in the evening 12 to 14 hours from now. And this is why I think our body is super amazing. And it's just fascinating how all these things work together to help you uh, get a better night's rest. And lately in this day and age, we don't get enough sleep. And this is something that I am a huge advocate for. I love my sleep now, you know, after incorporating all these practices that I will mention in the next video. But essentially all these things help me improve my sleep, improve my mood, improve my well-being. And I think that most, I think that a lot more people are sleep deprived than ever before, and I wanna help reduce that. So in the second video of this series, we're basically gonna be talking about the main strategies that you can utilize to improve or enhance the quality of your sleep. First things first is just have a consistent sleep schedule. Inconsistent sleep schedules are correlated to a poor quality of sleep. So if we put, you know, as we mentioned about the circadian rhythm, consistency is what our circadian rhythm values. And if you don't have an inconsistent sleep schedule, it's kind of hard to have good quality sleep as a result. Here are some things I recommend in setting a consistent sleep schedule. Number one is set a timer around 30 to 60 minutes before bed. This is gonna be a reminder for you to set up your sleep routine. 30 to 60 minutes before bed, oh, it's time for, my, for me to prepare for my evening, to prepare to fall asleep. Give yourself some time to fall asleep. We'll go into this a little bit more because this is important to have your own sleep ritual of the sort where it's like having a hot shower of the sort or preparing your clothes for the next morning or yeah, taking, taking a hot shower so you don't have to do it the following morning or writing, journaling, meditating, you know, listening to some calming music or some white noise or some nature sounds. Anything you need to do to prime yourself to sleep, these are some things to take into consideration, but we'll go in more in depth with these in the following video. Ultimately with this, you already know I'm all about the 80-20 rule. So it's as long as you're shooting 80% consistency, that's what matters. Try to be as consistent as possible, but obviously there's certain things, you know, stressors, life things that happen that may impact our sleep quality, but just make sure you're on point 80% of the time. And I guarantee you, you're gonna notice improved sleep quality as a result of it. Number two is sunlight exposure. I did mention this in the previous video, but sunlight exposure is so important in terms of quality sleep. Getting sunlight in the mornings allows us to release cortisol even more effectively. There's a lot of research that shows that when you get early morning sunlight, the cortisol Cortisol is released a lot earlier in the day. Research shows that if you get outdoor sun exposure, it just light in the eyes in the morning, your cortisol releases at an even earlier rate and it also primes your body for a more optimal evening. I'm not really good on the entirety of the scientific aspect of it, but basically getting outdoor sun exposure helps build that sleep pressure over time because in the evenings, you're gonna have a more optimal and easier time for you to produce melatonin as a result of getting sunlight exposure. And there's actually research that shows that light exposure has been shown to treat a lot of insomnia cases. So that's something you should take into consideration. So you know that sunlight is important. What should you do to optimize getting sun exposure? Number one, one thing I recommend is split your sun exposure to twice a day. What's really important is you should shoot for somewhere around sunrise and sunset. And essentially sunset helps prime your body more effectively towards the evening with melatonin production and stuff. And if you can't do this, get some sun on your lunch break. If you're at work, you know, go outside, go get some food, um, sit outdoors, eat outdoors, uh, watch a video outdoors, read a book outdoors. Give yourself some time to do something outdoors for at least 10 to 15 minutes, and maybe even more if you feel like it, but 10 to 15 minutes a day is a good ballpark range. You just get some sun exposure in the morning, get some light in the eyes, feel that breeze, get the, get the nature going, you know, listen to some nature, actual nature sounds in the background and enjoy that sun exposure. And lastly, if you're not getting enough light exposure in the day, supplement with vitamin D. Even though you produce vitamin D when you go outdoors, if you're not going outdoors, get some vitamin D in your body. 
Vitamin D has been shown to help with sleep quality for those who have an inefficient amount of vitamin D in their bodies. So it's something to take into consideration. If you're not getting enough vitamin D outdoors, supplement with it. But if you go outdoors, you may not need to supplement with it, but just monitor it. Vitamin D is pretty easy to buy on Amazon. Uh, I usually take it. If I'm not getting a lot of outdoor exposure for the day, I'll take a vitamin D capsule and I'll mix it with uh, some, some breakfast that has high fat content. The reason being is your body absorbs vitamin D better with some fats because it is a fat soluble vitamin. So just take that into consideration when supplementing with vitamin D. Number three, get to bed before midnight. This is just something I personally recommend just because if you time it right, you get that sunlight exposure early in the morning, you know, as the sun is coming up, get the light in your eyes before everyone else is waking up. Now I'm an early riser, guys. I have high energy in the mornings. I have a ton of energy in the morning. Some of you guys are not morning people like me. So time this to be most optimal for you. For me, I'm a psychopath. I fall asleep around 8.30, 9 p.m. at night. I just pass out. And then I'll wake up 5 4 or 5 a.m. just wired and ready to go. And I just do all the busy work in the morning. Some of you may wake up later on in the day because you prefer it like that way. There's nothing wrong with that. Everyone's different, you know, just putting that out there. But I want you to try to get to bed before midnight. And if you shoot for a 9 p.m. bedtime or 11 p.m. bedtime, somewhere around there, that's, in my opinion, a good optimal time. And this is mainly because it follows our circadian rhythm and follows our biological clock. And, and in addition to that, there's a lot of research that shows if people are getting light exposure around 11 p.m. to 4 a.m., around that time it impairs melatonin production. So if you're up late at night, and I know if you're up late at night, you're, you have some, you're glued to a screen or something like that. You're getting some light in your eyes, watching television, looking at memes, you know, all that stuff. You're not gonna get quality rest around that time if you're staying up late like that. If you try to fall asleep around that 9 p.m., 11 p.m. window, that's like the most opportune window in terms of sleep quality. Obviously there are exceptions to this rule, but it's just some ballpark recommendation that I recommend you try out and see how it goes. Number four, shoot for at least seven hours of sleep. I know everyone's different in this regard as well. Uh, some people can function off six hours actually effectively. If you're somebody that thinks that you get optimal six hours of sleep, get something like a sleep tracker, like an aura ring or a whoop bracelet and track your sleep. If you're getting six hours of sleep and your quality is shit, uh, maybe you might need more. <laughs> Me personally, I shoot for eight hours of sleep. When I get eight hours of sleep, it's perfect for me. It's great in terms of sleep quantity, but then with my quality, if I can mix that up with my better sleep habits and my eight hours of sleep, I get some amazing sleep. I feel incredible. Number five, limit all electronics before bed. I've kind of alluded to this guys, but blue light exposure in the evening impairs melatonin production at night. It impairs your circadian rhythm if you have blue light exposure at night because it mimics sunlight. As I mentioned in the previous video, when it's night and there's pitch darkness, your body starts to secrete melatonin. And if you get some light exposure, it's gonna suppress that secretion of melatonin. Now, there are some solutions around this. This is what I personally do that has helped me a ton. And this is something that I highly recommend you guys do. Wear red light glasses. I'm gonna show like a picture of myself wearing them because I'm not gonna go run and get it in the other room. I should have prepared with my equipment. But uh, I wear these red light glasses that block blue light in the evening and they work extremely well. Whenever I wear them, my sleep quality is so much better compared to when I don't. And I've tested this out personally. There's research that supports this, but having some sort of red light glasses can help with your sleep quality. I don't know the entire science behind it, but I'm gonna throw a link in the description below if you're interested in that uh, around Andrew Huberman's podcast. He gives a lot of information in regards to this. Another thing you can do is download on the computer an app called Flux. Actually, Flux reduces the blue light exposure in the evenings so that you get this red light or amber light exposure on your computer. iPhones have night, something called night shift as well. So in the evening, the lights tend to, the blue light tends to go down and then you get this amber light exposure. Now, personally, I still, even with the amber light exposure on my phones, I tend to still wear those amber glasses or the blue light blockers. I personally feel like they're a lot more effective. Now you can try this and test this out and see if it works for you, but I prefer to have some sort of insurance. One last thing about this is, as I mentioned in the previous thing, try to go to sleep between 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Avoid all light exposure from 11 p.m. to 4 a.m because that's gonna impair melatonin production or melatonin secretion. So that's something to take into consideration. Number six is to limit alcohol consumption. Limit, I'm not telling you to eliminate, 
just limit it before bed. Alcohol depresses our nervous system, and while people will say that alcohol can help them fall asleep, it actually impairs our sleep-wake cycle. Limit it, don't get too buzzed. Number seven, limit caffeine four to 10 hours before bed. This is individual to everybody. I tend to be a little caffeine sensitive compared to most, but I tend to stop my caffeine around 2 p.m. It's just my personal preference. I don't like to have any caffeine in the evenings just because I find it harder to fall asleep or I tend to wake up a little bit earlier in the morning and impair my quality of sleep as a result of it. And the reason for this, guys, is that caffeine is an adenosine antagonist. So as I mentioned in a previous video about adenosine, adenosine is that sleep pressure buildup. And if caffeine limits that or blocks that, it impairs our ability to fall asleep quicker. This is why like I'll have, when I talk to clients in the past, I ask them how their caffeine intake is and they're like, oh yeah, I get Starbucks at like 9 p.m. And then they wonder why I don't sleep. This is something to take into consideration. Please uh, avoid caffeine before bed. So essentially stop drinking caffeine four to 10 hours before bed. Just gauge it based on your personal preferences and how your quality of sleep improves as a result. And then also another recommendation, I personally recommend this might help you. I know that based on my experiences with caffeine, I know that that 200 to 400 milligram range, which is around two to four cups of coffee, has been the most optimal for me in terms of sleep quality. If I have anything above that, I get these levels of like anxiety, and this is most people on average, but you get higher levels of anxiety, you have trouble falling asleep, or you wake up in the middle of the night, things like that. All that stuff could potentially occur if you have too much caffeine in one day. So I say around a limit to two to four cups of coffee, around 200 to 400 milligrams of caffeine. Number eight, the most important one, in my opinion, it helped me so much, it jump-started all of this exercise consistently. You guys know I'm super biased when it comes to exercise. Exercise helped me with my depression and anxiety. And the reason being is I was too tired to think about or be depressed about things. I was just so exhausted from working out and so exhausted of all the things I had to do in day-to-day you know, in high school and dealing with all the events and stuff like that, I would pass out easily. And exercise was my ultimate hack in terms of improving my quality of sleep. And then from there, I was able to add on top of that and stack on top of that with these other sleep practices. But this was my jump start. All I needed to do was just go out there and sweat. I lifted my mood as a result of it. I improved my sleep quality as a result of it. I improved my appetite. I improved my food choices all because of exercise. Exercise has been shown to help normalize our circadian rhythm. It helps bring balance to it. And there's research that supports that people who tend to exercise in the morning report better sleep quality. Now, if you prefer to exercise in the evenings, limit your cardiovascular activity. I would say do some sort of anaerobic exercise like weightlifting. Reason being is cardiovascular activities like running can keep you up for longer periods of time. If you guys know, I do some jujitsu. At the end of the evenings, they have a 7 p.m. jujitsu class. I find it trouble falling asleep around my nine o'clock time as a result of it, so I tend to avoid that, and that's just a personal preference. It's a lot of cardiovascular activity. Uh, compared to weightlifting, I can do weightlifting in the evening, and then I can go home, eat a meal, and pass out. It just I just find it simple for me. Now, I did say something about early risers, but you can also take into consideration that there's research that supports the night owls who, who incorporate exercise in the evening tend to report better sleep quality. And like I said, I would recommend doing some anaerobic weightlifting style exercises in the evening if you're somebody that works out in the evening. You're still gonna get the better sleep quality. When I was dealing with these bouts, I started with late night workouts and I passed out like a baby as a result of it. So that's something to take into consideration. Those are the main strategies that I recommend primarily for your sleep. Now, what I'm gonna do in the next video is go into additional strategies that you can add to your sleep routine you know, with your sleep schedule, all that stuff. And I'll, t I'll basically give you guys my sleep schedule as well. So if you have any questions about anything I said, throw in the comments below. We'll talk soon and I'll see you in the next video. Thank you guys for watching this video. I have handpicked a video off to the side right here for you. So click on it. And in addition to that, also hit that subscribe button. Much love to you all. We'll talk soon. Peace.